welcome to our Palm Sunday service here at St. Jacob Lutheran Church. We begin uh, this special service uh, with liturgy that uh, can be printed out. Uh, it was in an email sent to you as an attachment. Um, our uh, service starts with the opening hymn, All Glory, Laud, and Honor. Uh, that's hymn 131. We'll sing verses 1, 3, and 5 at this time. 1, 3, and 5. Sunday service in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. We confess our sins. Forgive us, O Lord, when we have failed you as our Father one day, and failed to acknowledge you 24 hours later. Pardon us for calling ourselves your followers, yet denying you when the mood of our crowd changes. Be merciful to us for desiring to be a member of your church, yet forsaking you when we are called upon to take a stand for our Christian convictions. Forgive us, O Lord, in the name of the one who gave his life for our sins and became our Savior. Amen. God, our Heavenly Father, has forgiven you all your sins. By the perfect life and innocent death of our Lord Jesus, he has removed your guilt forever. You are his own dear child. May God give you strength to live according to his will. Amen. We continue by singing, Ride On, Ride On in Majesty. That's hymn 133. We'll sing the first two verses right now. Hymn 133, verses 1 and 2.
praise you, O God, for the great acts of love by which you have redeemed us through your Son, Jesus Christ. As he was acclaimed by those who scattered their garments and branches of palms in his path, so may we always hail him as our King and follow him with perfect confidence, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Our first lesson for this Palm Sunday is recorded in Zechariah 9, uh, reading verses 8 through 12. This Old Testament lesson tells us already about details that were written hundreds of years before about how the Lord would command his disciples uh, to get a, uh, a, a, a colt uh, or a donkey ready for him to ride into Jerusalem. I will set up camp around my house as a guard against those passing back and forth. The oppressor will never again march over them, because now I am watching with my own eyes. Rejoice greatly, daughter of Zion. Shout, daughter of Jerusalem. Look, your king is coming to you. He is righteous and brings salvation. He is humble and riding on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. I will cut off the chariot from Ephraim and the horse from Jerusalem. The battle bow will be taken away, and he will proclaim peace to the nations. His kingdom will extend from sea to sea, from the river to the ends of the earth. As for you, because of the blood of my covenant with you, I will release your prisoners from the waterless pit. Return to the stronghold, you prisoners who have hope. This very day I declare that I will restore double to you. This ends um, the Old Testament lesson. The word of the Lord. We continue by singing uh, hymn 133, verses 3 and 4. Verses 3 and 4. The second lesson is also the sermon text for today. It is from Philippians 2, reading verses 5 through 11, and it shows us how Jesus, in his divine nature, did not consider that something to be grasped or held on to, but was willing uh, to serve God his Father and go uh, to earth and take on a human form and become obedient uh, in a very uh, great degree. We read uh, from Philippians 2, uh, verses 5 through 11. Indeed, this, let this attitude be in you, which is also in Christ Jesus. Though he was by nature God, he did not consider equality with God as a prize to be displayed. But he emptied himself by taking the nature of a servant. When he was born in human likeness and his appearance was like that of any other man, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore God also highly exalted him and gave him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus every knee will bow, in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. We now sing verse 5 of hymn 133. Hymn 133, verse 5.
gospel lesson for today is recorded in Matthew 21, beginning at verse uh, 1. And it, it describes the account in Matthew's version of uh, how uh, Jesus rode triumphantly into Jerusalem as the King of Kings and receiving praise as uh, the uh, Son of David, uh, Hosanna in the highest. As they approached Jerusalem and came to Bethphage on the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two disciples, telling them, Go to the village ahead of you. Immediately you will find a donkey tied there along with her colt. Untie them and bring them to me. If anyone says anything to you, you are to say, The Lord needs them, and he will send them at once. This took place to fulfill what was spoken through the prophet. Tell the daughter of Zion, Look, your king comes to you, humble and riding on a donkey on a colt, the foal of a donkey. The disciples went and did just as Jesus commanded them. They brought the donkey and the colt, laid their outer clothing on them, and he sat on it. A very large crowd spread their outer clothing on the road. Others were cutting branches from the trees and spreading them out on the road. The crowds who went in front of them and those who followed kept shouting, Hosanna to the Son of David! Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord! Hosanna in the highest! We continue by confessing our faith according to uh, the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. We'll now have our object list. This, of course, is a trash basket with uh, waste paper in it, and it's about ready to be thrown out or thrown into the fire. Oh, there's, you know, paper in here and tissue and napkin and old magazines and all of it is garbage. But what if I told you there was an envelope in here that had a $20 bill? Then you would think twice about throwing out the garbage, wouldn't you? And throwing it into the trash. Well, inside this envelope is a $20 bill. You can't see it, of course. Um, that would describe how Jesus um, appeared to us. He looked like us. He appeared like, like trash, but inside was something very valuable. And he was willing to empty himself, to take on the form of, the, of a servant for us. He did that uh, because he loved us. And he humbled himself so much, even that he did it to the point of uh, dying on the cross. You see, he did that because, again, he loved us, he wanted to live with us. And he wanted by that to have us um, uh, believe in him and fill our hearts so that we would want to do the things he created to us to do, to love him and to serve him. And so, while he may not look that different on the outside of his human nature, inside, and with his divine nature, he is very valuable. And he considered us uh, not waste people, but we're saving. And he came to this earth to rescue us. We say her. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you that uh, you left your throne in heaven, that you considered us more than waste to be burned, but you were willing to suffer and die, um, that you might save us. And for that you were uh, highly exalted, uh, restored again to your uh, divine throne in heaven. Um, you did that to love us and to want us uh, to know uh, 
to share that love that uh, we have with others. Help us to do that um, as you willingly and humbly served others. Amen. We continue by singing the sermon hymn. Grace and peace to you from God our Father and our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ on this Palm Sunday day. Dear friends in Christ, how humble are you? It is a difficult uh, to answer that question positively. If we say, uh, I am very humble, in fact I am the most humble person I know, uh, that would not be showing humility. In 1980, a country music singer named Mac Davis recorded a song that became an international hit. The song was called, Oh Lord, It's Hard to Be Humble. The refrain went like this. Oh Lord, it's hard to be humble when you're perfect in every way. I can't wait to look in the mirror because I get better looking each day. To know me is to love me. I must be a hell of a man. Oh Lord, it's hard to be humble, but I'm doing the best that I can. Of course, this song was meant to be humorous, and it describes a person who is not humble in any way, but God's Word directs us to be humble in every way. A humble heart will listen to God's voice, but a proud or arrogant heart will put up a wall and refuse to listen. Listen to the psalmist David. He directs the humble to do what is right, and he teaches the humble his way. Paul encourages us in Ephesians, be completely humble and gentle, be patient, bearing with one another in love. By the power of the Holy Spirit, the Apostle Paul compels us to follow Christ's example of humility. Real humility serves others. Jesus served, let us serve. Jesus served us, let us serve one another. To understand the depth of Christ's humility, we first need to recognize that Jesus is God. Paul begins by saying, though he was by nature God, Jesus was God. At the beginning of the world, Jesus was already God. The Apostle John begins his gospel by declaring, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Through Him, everything was made, and without Him, not one thing was made that had been made. Later he quotes Jesus, I and the Father are one. 
Yet Romans, Paul states that from the patriarchs came the Christ, who is God over all, eternally blessed. Paul tells us in Colossians, all the fullness of God's being dwells, in, uh, dwells bodily in Christ. And Hebrews chapter 1 repeatedly states that Christ is God, equal with the Father from all eternity. These are just some of the passages that affirm that Jesus was, is, and ever will be God. From eternity, Jesus had been one with the Father. His eternal existence as God is unshakable and unchangeable. When Jesus, while Jesus fully retained his divine nature, he took on a true human nature. When Jesus was conceived by the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary, he became true God and true man. God's word clearly asserts, For there is one God and one mediator between God and mankind, the man Christ Jesus. Yet Christ is not two Christs, but one Christ. He is not half God and half man, but totally God and totally man in one person. The formula of Pomper puts it this way, we believe, teach, and confess that now, in this one undivided person of Christ, there are two distinct natures. Uh, the divine, which is from eternity, and the human, which in time was assumed into the unity of the person of the Son of God, which two natures in the person of Christ are never either separated from or mingled with one another, or changed into one, the one into the other, but each abides in its nature and essence in the person of Christ to all eternity. Jesus is equal with God in power, in authority, in majesty, and he possesses all the attributes of God. Even when he lived on this earth, Jesus was always equal with God in glory and majesty. He just didn't live like God. Oh, there were a few times when Jesus displayed a glimpse of his divinity, when he felt the multitudes, healed the blind and the crippled, cast out demons, and raised, even raised the dead. As God, he could read and judge people's thoughts. He prophesied his death, resurrection, and return on a judgment day. But most of the time, he didn't live like God. He humbled himself and lived like us. Christ's divine nature is not something he snatched for himself. Jesus did not consider equality with God as a prize to be uh, displayed. He didn't regard it as something to be grasped, to be flaunted, to be paraded around or displayed as a trophy. In Paul's day, when a victorious general returned from war, he would publicly display the spoils of war for his own personal gain and glory. Although Jesus possessed divine power and glory, he did not make a public show of them or use it to gain earthly fame and fortune. Instead of using his power and glory for his own gain, Jesus emptied himself by taking the very nature of a servant. He didn't empty himself as the, of his divinity, but he emptied himself of the full and constant use of his divine power and glory. Except for periodic glimpses of his glory, Jesus looked and acted like any other man. Just by looking at him, you would never know he was God. He looked more like a servant. Jesus was like a king who hid his royal garments underneath a beggar's cloak. He took on the form of a servant. His appearance uh, reflected his true humanity while his miracles uh, mirrored his divine uh, love and mercy. A reporter once did a story on what it was like for presidents when they left office. The reporter tried to explain uh, the incredible letdown after serving as the American president, uh, arguably uh, the most powerful position on earth. The song, Hail to the Chief, used to be played every time the president entered a public gathering, but not anymore. No more flying on Air Force One, no waiting for a helicopter that takes off immediately, no more uh, valets, butlers, or personal attendants. When George Bush, the elder, uh, woke up the morning after his presidency, he sat there in bed waiting for his coffee and uh, his uh, morning paper to be brought to him. And then his wife Barbara said to get up and get it himself. 
All of this fails to compare to what Jesus did for you and me. Think of all the glory and power that he had uh, um, with the Father from eternity. Think of the innumerable angels who covered their eyes as they praised him. Think of the splendor of heaven. And Jesus left all of that behind for you. As Paul wrote, you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that although he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor, so that through his poverty you might become rich. Christ's true humility was nowhere more apparent than it was in his death. Our text says, He humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. His humility went beyond the humble birth and a simple life. It led him to a death that was normally reserved for the worst of criminals. Crucifixion was the cruelest, the most despised kind of death. It was a death reserved only for the worst criminals and slaves. It was extremely pain, uh, uh, extremely painful death for Jesus because he paid for every sin ever committed. Our Savior is both God and man in one person, and he had to be to save us. As true man, he could experience hunger, thirst, agony, ridicule, and even death. As true God, he could obey uh, God's law perfectly and redeem all people. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who has been tempted in every way just as we are, yet was without sin. On Palm Sunday, we celebrate Jesus as the King of Kings. Can you picture a king serving others? His throne, a cross? His crown made of thorns? The robe stained with blood? What did Jesus do? Why did Jesus do all this? Why did he hide behind his power and glory? Why did he humble himself by dying so shamefully on a cross? He did it for you. Out of love for you. An unspeakable sinner, the God-man died for you. He suffered not just any death, but the most shameful of deaths. He endured not just any cross, and not for any sin of his own, but for your sins and mine. If you are from Michigan, you may know that on November 10, 1975, the Edmund Fitzgerald sank beneath the waves of Lake Superior in a tumultuous storm. The next month, Gordon Lightfoot composed a ballad to commemorate the 29 men who drowned. His ballad contains a sad line that asks, does anyone know where the love of God goes when the waves turn minutes to hours? When waves of illness affliction, guilt, or dealing with a virus or death itself turn the minutes to hours. We may wonder where the love of God has gone. But the love of God went all the way to the cross. There he showed us how much he loved us, and he stretched out his arms and died. Because Jesus abundant, obediently humbled himself to such a degree, God exalted him and gave him a name that is above every name so that at the name of Jesus, every knee will bow. In his exalted state, Jesus is like the king who has dropped his beggar's cloak and revealed his royal robes. He no longer limits his divine power, but resumes full and continuous use of his divine majesty over everything for us. God the Father approved of the redeeming work of his Son, carried out for us sinners. His stamp of approval includes giving the victorious Savior, the name that is above every name. You see, Jesus is not just a name, for throughout time many men have had that name, but Jesus is the name, which embraces all that God has revealed about him. No name is more important and highly honored than Jesus, for there is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given to men by which we must be saved. One of the results of Christ's exaltation is that one day all will bow to his authority and either willingly or unwillingly acknowledge that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. Without exception, everyone will confess Jesus as Lord. At the name of Jesus, every knee will bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. When Jesus appears as the glorious judge, the saints and angels in heaven, the people alive on earth and the condemned 
in hell will all confess Jesus as Lord. These three groups represent all created beings, and they will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord of all. Paul's wording suggests a confessional formula. The name Lord signifies the eternal Son, now incarnate, and having been fully exalted according to his human nature, will receive the praise and honor that is due him. When Jesus is confessed as Lord, God the Father is ultimately receives the praise. For the Father is the one who sent his Son into the world. He is the one who sacrificed his Son for us. After you were converted by the Holy Spirit, you confess your faith in Jesus, give glory to the Father, and share with others his boundless love. To those who reject him, confessing Jesus as Lord will only bring terror and regret. To believers, in Jesus, it will give glory and praise to our Father, who loved us so much he sent his Son to save us. Real humility serves others. Let us imitate Christ's humility and serve one another. Paul speaks of our need for an attitude adjustment, which presupposes that our natural nature needs adjusting. Since sin has corrupted our natural attitude to exhibits uh, uh, that exhibits selfishness and unkindness, our nature does need to be changed. When the Holy Spirit converted our hearts to believe in the good news that Jesus paid for our sins and rescued us from death and hell, our attitude toward God and others changed. But there is still a struggle against Satan, self, and the sinful world. Our text urges us to continually pattern our minds after Christ. It echoes Christ's counsel, take my yoke upon you and learn from me because I am gentle and humble in heart. Jesus is our power source. Only when we understand the love that Jesus had for us, only when we keep our eyes on Jesus and see what he's done for us, and only when we listen to Jesus can we have the power to humbly serve others. Scripture advises us to humble ourselves before others. For by the grace given me, I say to every one of you, do not think more highly than you ought, but rather think of yourself with sober judgment. Paul exhorts all of you to clothe yourself with humility toward one another. For God opposes the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. Therefore, humble yourselves under God's powerful hand, so that he may lift you up at the appointed time. Humble yourselves and consider others better than yourselves. When you look at others, it is easy to only look at the outward differences and actions and judge people. You may evaluate them and say, well, they're not as rich as I am. Uh, they don't, uh, they're not as pious as I am. They don't raise their children like I do. Then we are emphasizing the differences and obviously judging them as inferior because they are not like us. We may ignore them, snub them, and even show them disdain. But Jesus urges us to look at people through the shepherd's eyes and see how similar they are to us. They are sinners just like you. They are precious blood-bought souls just like you. They are precious to Jesus just like you. If you look at people through the eyes of Jesus, you will look for ways to serve others. You will see everyone as a soul for whom Jesus died, a soul for whom Jesus redeemed, a soul whom he has loved and, um, uh, and um, atoned for all their sins, a soul whom Jesus wants in his fold. So humble yourselves and serve others. As God's servants, we don't grab for glory, position, or power. Real humility serves others. As Jesus humbly served us, let us serve, humbly serve others. As God's servants, we are obedient to Christ our Lord, to the glory of God the Father. Amen. I may the peace that surpasses all human understanding keep your hearts and minds through faith in Christ Jesus. Amen. We will now pray. Lord Jesus, you are the King of heaven and earth. We join the first Palm Sunday worshipers in praising and glorifying you for coming to this earth to be our Savior. Though you are one with God the Father and Lord of all, 
You humbled yourself and became one with us. Thanks be to you for living a life of perfect conformity to God's holy law in our place. Praise be to you for being obedient to death, even death on a cross, to redeem us from sin. Cause our voices to blend with those who sang your praises as you rode into Jerusalem. Move us to confess you before others. Help us proclaim the message of peace and forgiveness to all nations. Use us to assure all people that your blood has cleansed them from sin and set them free from slavery to sin, death, and the devil. Move us to dedicate all that we are and have to your glory. Lord Jesus, you are king over all the earth. Bless the nations of this world with wise rulers and good government. Let peace prevail. Grant success to the businesses and industries of our land to serve for the common good. Cause all employers to be honest and fair-minded and all employees to be diligent and faithful. Look with favor on our nation's schools uh, when they return. Be with those who teach and those who learn. Comfort the sick and the afflicted with the assurance of your care and protection. Strengthen the faith of the dying. Sovereign Lord, we bow low before you in this time of national calamity with the uh, COVID-19 virus. We confess that as a nation we have deserved your punishing, uh, chastening judgments. Yet we also trust your promises that even when you chasten, your purposes are loving and good. Be present uh, with us. Uh, with your strong comfort among those most directly affected by this calamity, and in your mercy make shattered lives whole again. Use this tragedy of this virus that is overtaking our nation and the world to make us, as a nation, deeply aware of our total dependence on you. Give us courage to face whatever our future holds, knowing that it and we are in your hands. Hear us, Lord, as we bring you our private petition. Dear Savior, as we walk with you this week toward Calvary, keep us focused on your purpose for coming into this world and on our calling to spread this wonderful message of salvation. Hear us for your mercy's sake. Amen. We pray the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. Amen. We conclude with the singing of the last hymn, Thank mm -hmm. you.
this concludes our, our worship. Just an announcement. We um, do plan to uh, have uh, these recorded services um, uh, for Monday, Thursday, and Good Friday. Uh, that would be uh, later this week. Um, and uh, unfortunately, uh, also for Easter Sunday. Uh, while you can't be here uh, in body, we hope and pray that you will be with us in spirit, and we ask God to guide uh, and uh, protect each and every one of you. Uh, while many things are canceled, um, a church council uh, did meet and will continue to meet uh, via video and tele uh, teleconference, and uh, it was decided at the uh, last uh, meeting to suspend worship services through the month of April. Uh, we hope to begin uh, worship services publicly again on May 5th. Until then, uh, we will uh, provide you with these recorded services. And the Lord bless and keep you.